Alright guys, welcome to what is going to be the last part of the E55's engine rebuild. And this part is just going to be about starting up the engine and testing it. So doing a quick compression test on it and also testing all the different values from all the different sensors. Just making sure everything is working normally. I apologize for the delay with this one because I had everything done for a while but I didn't get to uploading the video because I was just um, a little busy with a few things. But anyways, getting to what I did to the engine and what I've done so far since the last video which is not an awful lot because luckily I was able to get this engine started right on the engine stand. Um, so I didn't even have to take this engine off the engine stand and um, bolt the transmission on and all the rest of the work uh, which works really well for me because I would have had to take this engine off and put it back on the engine stand later anyways because I plan to do some more changes to the engine like uh, moving the turbos to the front custom exhaust manifolds and all that um, so that worked out really well for me that I was able to get this engine started <laughs> right on the engine stand. For starting the engine up all I literally had to do was just drag all this engine along with the engine stand back in the car and then I had to connect these wires to the ECU and to the fuse box. These are the wires that um, like basically the main wiring harness coming from the engine that gives all the different sensors and injectors like the signal and I had to connect the evap line over here and the fuel line that supplies the fuel to the fuel injectors and other than that, I had to connect the ground wires with the power steering, which grounds the entire engine. For the coolant lines, I just closed the whole system because I was too lazy to even connect the radiator. So what I did was I just um, took the, like this is usually where the radiator goes, but to bypass the radiator, I just connected this metal um, pipe over here. So the coolant just circulates around and doesn't really have to go through a radiator. For this one, I did have to be careful. So I was monitoring my coolant temperature. So right when the coolant temperature goes to about 80 degrees, I cut the, I turned the engine off because it could have overheated without the radiator. Um, same with the power steering lines, actually. I just looped them back to the same place so I didn't have to connect the steering rack or anything. Um, and same with the oil cooler. I just looped it back so I didn't have to connect an oil cooler. And for all the other lines, for all the other like coolant lines and stuff, I just blocked them off so the coolant doesn't flow out of here. I did have to like fill the engine up with coolant all the way to the top so I could actually monitor my um, coolant temperatures and also to make sure the engine doesn't overheat. And other than that, there was one more wire. There was this positive 12 volt wire. This is the wire that supplies positive 12 volts to the starter and to the alternator. Um, this had to be connected to the car. And other than that, for the exhaust, all I did was I cut the exhaust off. So I cut this part of the exhaust off so I didn't have to connect the rest of the exhaust. The important part of the exhaust is just this one because this one has the O2 sensors on them. There's four O2 sensors, two over here and then two O2 sensors over here. So since I had the O2 sensors, the rest of the exhaust doesn't even matter. You can just uh, even start the engine without the exhaust. Like these O2 sensors are the important part for actually monitoring if your like engine is working properly and if your uh, fuel trims are at the right level. And yeah, believe it or not, that was pretty much it. That was everything I had to connect to get this engine started. Now as simple as all that sounded, obviously there had to be some issues along the way. And the first issue I ran into was that when I tried turning the key, um, the ECU wouldn't give the starter the signal to start, like the fuel pump would turn on and everything would be fine, but there was no signal going to the starter, so the engine wouldn't really um, crank. Uh, so what I had to do was I had to give it that signal myself, so I had to get underneath the car, like connect the wire to the starter. Um, yeah, basically the same way you steal a car, but the engine still wasn't starting. There was also another issue, but that was just because I had these oversized fuel injectors so that so the ear fuel ratios weren't matching up. Because the car was sitting without power for a while, so I guess like it had to relearn all the new injectors and everything. So what I initially had to do was I had to um, correct the pulse width of the injectors using the FIC. So I had to connect my laptop to the AEM FIC and fix a few values. And once I figured all that out, by that time my battery died. So I had to connect the battery charger. That wasted pretty much the whole day. But once all that was done, the engine definitely did start. And I guess I'll let you guys listen to the very first part of this engine. Now the first start of the engine does definitely take a while, like it's not a perfect smooth start just like um, when you usually start your car, that's because there's air in the fuel lines and um, all other things, so that's why it's definitely a rough start. Um, but yeah, other than that everything else I think sounded pretty much normal. Since it was getting pretty late, I just started the engine for like a few minutes and then just killed it. I left checking all the values and doing all the tests for the next day. So for the next day I started off by connecting an oil pressure gauge so I could also have a look at my oil pressures. And I also used an OBD2 scanner to make sure that all the other um, values from coming from all the other sensors on this engine were normal, um, just to make sure that everything is normal on the engine. For connecting an oil pressure gauge on this engine, it's super easy because there's already a place given where you have to connect it, so all you have to do is remove the plug that's already there. Um, it's the size is M12 by 1.5. Most gauges that you'll find that come after market come in a size that's 1.8 NPT, so you might need an adapter for this one. Uh, so yeah, I just put that adapter there and put that sensor at the back, and that was pretty much it to the installation. 
I made another video on this when I installed an oil pressure gauge in my SL, so if you want to see this whole process in detail, you can watch that video. So I have the oil pressure gauge hooked up now, I've just taped it over here for now, so I'll probably have to leave the camera over here to check the pressures later, but I'm pretty sure everything should be fine. And just to tell you some of the other values that I'm checking. So I have my code scanner plugged into the car, and this will give me all the other readings that I need from the ECU. Um, so battery voltage over here, oil temperature, that's really important. Um, oil level, oil level is fine, like I also checked on the car, it was saying oil level okay. So after that I have the temperature of coolant, the air intake temperature, engine speed, and basically yeah, all the different values that, all the different sensors that your engine has, this um, scanner will actually be able to um, get the values from those. Um, so you can actually test everything, like the oil temperature of all the, well not oil pressure because the car doesn't even have an oil pressure sensor. And also the O2 values coming from the oxygen sensors, but I also have my wideband. Um, so that's something that I can see much better on the wideband actually. Um, so yeah, now I, all I have to do is start the engine, just let it run for a bit and just make sure that all the values are normal. And that will tell me that my engine looks pretty good. And once the engine gets up to temperature, then I'm going to be pulling it out of the car again and doing a quick compression test. So this was the second start of the engine and this time you can actually see the oil pressures. Uh, the oil pressures do seem a bit high, um, that's probably just because it's a new engine, the clearances are so small and I already put a 50 weight oil in there. Um, the usual oil that the dealers recommend is 40 weight for this one. So initially when I started the engine the pressures went all the way up to 100 psi, that's, uh, that's high but that's not ridiculously high, like that wouldn't cause any damage or anything. But later when things got up to temperature the oil pressures did come down to 50 psi at idle. Uh, the oil still wasn't up to temperature, I monitored the oil temperatures. It's was staying around 20 degrees. Um, I guess I would need to put the engine under actual load to get the oil up to temperature and then see the pressures. Um, that's the only time I'll get a true indication of what the oil pressures are at idle. But I'm sure when the oil gets up to temperature and then when everything else is uh, up to its proper temperature, the oil pressures will come down. So I'm pretty sure everything is normal as far as that goes. So after running the car for a while, everything is looking normal. The idle has calmed down. The air fuel ratios are looking pretty much normal. Like it's running slightly richly, but that's what it's supposed to do at idle. Um, yeah, but the temperatures are getting close to 90 degrees right now. So I'm going to kill the engine now because I don't want it to overheat because there is no radiator connected. You guys are wondering what an E55 engine sounds like without the torque converter and the whole exhaust. Well, there you go. Shouldn't be revving the engine this much without the proper break in, but oh. So after that I had to quickly disconnect the engine from the car and pull it back in the garage. This is just so I could do one final compression test on the engine when the engine was still up to temperature. Getting to the compression test, so a compression test is a pretty easy test that you can do on your engine just to make sure that the engine is making the proper compression. It's a good test of whether your piston rings are sealing properly or, or, you, or whether your valves are sealing properly and pretty much everything inside the combustion chamber really. Um, because if anything is leaking, your engine will not make the proper compression and you'll be able to tell that there's a problem inside one of the cylinders. Um, so to do a compression test all you need is like one of these cheap compression testers or you can even go with an expensive one if you want. Um, but really it's a really simple thing. Um, it's just a pressure gauge with a line and it has this adapter at the end which is the same threads as your spark plug really and an o-ring. So all you have to do is you have to take one of your spark plugs out from each cylinder. Um, this engine has two per cylinder so you only have to take out one. Um, but for other engines that only have one spark plug, obviously you just remove that one spark plug and then you stick this compression gauge in there, uh, your compression tester in there I should say. You don't need to tighten this too much because there is a rubber o-ring that seals against it and yeah just tighten it just by a little bit and that's usually enough. Um, once the compression tester is in there, all you have to do is crank the engine and what happens is that when your engine like makes the proper compression it like it gives you a pressure reading on this gauge. And that's the pressure of compression that that cylinder is making at like at whatever speed the starter is cranking it at. Now this is not like a perfectly accurate test because there are a lot of things that can change your compression values like let's say what speed your starter is actually spinning at. Um, so if you have more battery voltage you might 
be able to get slightly higher compression. Temperatures will affect these readings by a lot. So whether the air temperature is cooler, what the humidity level, all that stuff. Um, so that's why even when you look at the service manual and the ranges they give in the service manual, they do give a really broad range for pressures, like acceptable pressures for this test, um, just because different conditions will change these pressures so much. But the real numbers you're looking for in this test is the pressure differences between um, all the different cylinders in your engine. Because if one cylinder is way lower than all the other ones, that definitely tells you that there's something wrong with that one. Either the piston rings aren't sealing or the valves aren't sealing against the valve seats, or even a leaking spark plug if the spark plug isn't seated properly and um, that's not sealing. Um, so any leak basically inside the engine um, can be detected by this test. Um, if you do find a problem in a compression test, the next step is usually to do a leak down test. A leak down test is pretty similar to this one, but you actually put air pressure into the um, cylinder in the leak down test, and then you actually see how much of a leak there is inside that cylinder, and also you can listen for um, where the leak is. If you hear a leak in the exhaust, that means that your exhaust valves might not be sealing up properly. If you hear the air coming out of the intake, that means your intake valves might not be sealing properly. And if you hear the leak going like down in your crankcase, that means that your piston rings aren't sealing properly. But usually if the compression test results come up normal you don't need to go through that extra step of doing a leak down test and everything um, because that is good enough to indicate that your engine is in good health here's a look at the final results from doing the compression test on this engine I did it both when the engine was cold and also when the engine was hot uh, when the engine was up to operating temperature I should say um, so yeah this is basically cylinder one two three four and then five six seven and eight and these are the pressures from each of these ones um, so the number you're looking for is well first um, I'll show you the so these are the values that um, the service manual says that you should be getting well the acceptable range for this test um, N113.990 is uh, the E55's engine, so these are the numbers you should be looking at. These numbers are in bar, but I've converted it to PSI over here because uh, my compression tester reads in PSI. Uh, so yeah, the range of acceptable values, like all the values should be between 132 and 176, which for my engine, yeah, it does seem that way. I should be looking at the hot values. The cold values is just like something I did uh, just for like, um, just being extra sure before starting the engine that everything was okay. Um, but yeah, really these are the values that matter. And well, the more important number is actually this one. This is the um, compression difference between individual cylinders. So it should be 22 PSI. Um, so for my engine, the difference between the smallest value and the highest value is 17 PSI. Uh, so that's still within this range. And well, some of the cylinders, like the lowest values were at 155, so for five and six. And the highest value f was for number four at 172. Um, but I did repeat the test again just to make sure that um, like whether there wasn't a problem in these two ones, whether the piston rings were sealing properly. And yeah, when I did the test the second time, these values did pick up and like some other values were on the smaller side. Even when you compare the values of the cold um, engine and the warm engine, you can see that um, for the cold engine, this one's the lowest value, whereas um, for the hot engine, these two are the lowest values. So that's just a slight error in the test. Whenever you repeat the test again, you do get slightly different values. Um, so I wasn't getting a consistently low value on um, like one cylinder. So like, um, let's say if I repeated the test twice and I had a consistently low value on number five, um, that would have meant that maybe there's a problem in number five, maybe the piston rings in number five weren't sealing properly, but that wasn't the case when I did the test again. Um, I got different values, like some values picked up, other values went down. Um, so that's just um, the error in the test. When you repeat the test again, you will get some slight difference. But really, it's surprising to see that um, the pressures are still pretty high in this engine because um, like, if you followed the previous parts where I made some internal changes to the engine, I actually lowered the compression ratio of this engine down to 8.5 to 1, whereas it should have been a 9 to 1, like what it comes like from the factory. And also, I've gapped the piston rings. So I've opened the piston rings to 0.7 of a millimeter, so that's an awful lot. Um, so it's pretty surprising to see that the compression values are still so good, even after making those changes. But yeah, all in all, I have to say extremely happy with the way this um, rebuild has turned out. Also, like um, showing you guys the underneath of the engine, there's no oil leaks, there's no coolant leaks, and um, no major issues with the engine at all, at least so far. Um, everything does seem extremely normal. Um, so yeah, definitely the this whole engine rebuild has gone really smooth. There hasn't been any major issues along the way. Um, and I have to say thanks a lot to Tassos for all his advice um, with this engine rebuild. Um, he did give me a lot of advice and um, also watching his videos and uh, watching his channel, I did learn a lot from him. And also thanks a lot to all you guys in the comment section that helped out along the way and um, just giving suggestions and um, yeah, just in general, it makes you feel a lot safer when you have so many people um, watching what you're doing. So in case I did make a mistake somewhere along the way, I knew I would have um, had someone point that out. Um, so yeah, that just gives you the extra amount of confidence when you're doing something like this. 
So now I am done with the engine, but obviously the work hasn't ended here. There is a few more changes I have to make, like um, from some of the changes you already know of. I'm going to bring the turbos to the front. I'm um, going with custom exhaust manifolds, like finding a way to get rid of the supercharger, maybe going with the custom intake manifold or um, something else. And also like a whole new project that I'm planning for next year. Um, I'm pretty much done with the design now, so I'll probably get to, uh, I'll probably um, try to get the video uploaded by um, next week, hopefully. Um, it depends how much time I get. I'll try to get it uploaded as quickly as possible. Um, it's a really cool project. Um, I'm not planning to use this engine in the E55, unfortunately, just because when you add all the costs together, like um, um, turning the E55 into a proper race car rather than just um, building a proper race car from scratch, I think it's a much better idea to just um, start from scratch, like use the components from the E55 because they're definitely amazing components. Um, this is definitely an amazing engine and also all the rest of the components in the car, the brakes, um, the differential, I have a pretty good differential in that car, the uh, wave track limited slip differential, especially when I have the opportunity, like right now half the car is pulled apart, so it's a really good time to actually um, go with something like that. Uh, so yeah, try to stay tuned for the next few videos. Um, thanks a lot for watching and see you guys in the next one.